Good afternoon and welcome everyone to the Frank Islam Athenaeum Symposia Speaker Series. My name is Tiffany Banks and I'm Assistant Professor of Communication Studies and I'm also the co-coordinator of the Athenaeum along with my colleague uh, Dr. Joanne Bagshaw, Professor of Psychology and Women's Studies. Uh, we're so glad to see all of you here today for what is sure to be a truly exciting event and discussion. If you would like to receive emails and information about the Athenaeum, please feel free to visit our website at www.montgomerycollege/athenaeum. You can sign up for our mailing list and you can also find out about future events. Uh, before we begin, I just have a couple of practical notes that I'd like to go over with you all. First, if you're a student and you need a certificate of attendance for being here today, you can find those certificates out at the front table, just to the left when you exit the door. For faculty and staff who wish to receive multicultural and diversity credit, if you haven't already registered online, you can register at the front entrance as well. Many of you, or most of you, should have received a blue uh, a response card when you came in. Please uh, take a moment and fill out that response card. We'll be collecting those at the end of the event today. We also ask that you silence your cell phones so that uh, we don't distract each other uh, during today's discussion. Also, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions. We'll have a question and answer session after the talk today. Uh, we ask that you please come to the microphone here in the center uh, so that you can, at the designated time, join in in that question and answer. And um, now what I'd like to do is introduce uh, Sarah Ducey. Sarah will be introducing our speaker today. She is the college-wide chair of integrative studies, and she's also the director of the Paul Peck Humanities Institute. Um, Sarah? Well, welcome everybody. What a joyful audience. I'm just so pleased that in December you found some time to come for an extraordinarily important uh, presentation. And I want to thank both uh, Tiffany and Joy on further work with the um, Frank Islam Athenaeum Symposium. This is our third year collaborating with them on what we call the Bella Mishkinsky Memorial Lecture. And um, we're particularly um, proud of Bella, and I'll tell you in a moment why. Um, Bella um, came to, uh, she was a Holocaust survivor, and she came to the United States in 1946. She was born in 22 and lived in Poland at the time, and so she lived through the Holocaust, came to the United States, and selected this county, Montgomery County, to live. And she was here until her retirement uh, when she went to Clearwater. She worked as a volunteer with the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. And then she also worked with our own College Alumni Association. As a part of that, she became more and more familiar with our college, and she actually took a course here. So Bella Mishkinsky, for whom this lecture is named, was one of our students, though she was an adult, as you can imagine, at the time. Bella and her sister did sit for the Portraits of Life Holocaust Survivors of Montgomery County exhibit and you're gonna hear about that um, briefly from my colleague Ken Jassy, who manages that program, uh, both the exhibit and the program. So Bella was one of our students, and interestingly, she and her husband, a man named Henry, but known as Hank Bermanis, uh, enrolled in the class that is called Literature of the Holocaust. Now, Literature of the Holocaust is offered at our Rockville campus, it was created by Dr. Myrna Goldenberg, and Dr. Myrna Goldenberg also created the Paul Peck Humanities Institute, and I direct that program, and it is in that role uh, that I'm here today, and the Paul Peck Humanities Institute became really our vehicle for sharing and informing people about the genocides in the, Uni in the United States and elsewhere, I do apologize, in elsewhere, and also the Holocaust. So we have a course here at this campus on genocide studies and the Holocaust, um, and we have the literature of the Holocaust, and we have a variety of community programs 
to help people better understand what has happened. And you're going to learn a lot from um, Emmanuel Mandel shortly about that. But here's sort of a charming and sort of a important piece about Bella, is that she was pretty, um, she had a lot of grit, and she said what she thought. And here's what she said to Dr. Myrna Goldenberg in this class. She said, I'm taking this class to make sure you're teaching the Holocaust right. It's like, I'm going to hold your feet um, and make sure that we really get the course. Well, she was actually tremendously um, reassured and relieved to have a, a wonderful experience in that class. Um, later, she told Dr. Goldenberg that it was the first time that her husband began to speak about his own experiences in the Holocaust, that he had not been talking, and that this class really, truly opened up uh, his ability to have conversations, and that the conversations went on in their home every night. And so um, Myrna, Dr. Goldenberg, the teacher, um, was challenged one day by Myrna where she said, you know, Myrna, you should be paying rent in our home. And Myrna was a little confused by that, and she said, we talk about you every day. You're present every day. You should be paying rent to be in our home. But it became a really important part of their marriage to be able to talk about the experiences that both um, Hank and Bella had had. And this course we still offer, again, as I said, at our Rockville campus. And we also do a Holocaust commemoration in the spring each year. And we've done that for 21 years. Um, so um, the Bella Mishkinsky Memorial Lecture was really designed to um, expand our work to come to this campus, to Germantown, and to bring either a scholar or a journalist or an advocate to the college to talk about important issues around the Holocaust. And um, you're going to learn more about our speaker in a moment. But I really want to thank you all for taking the time to learn more. There probably isn't uh, a time in our, in our contemporary United States history where this topic has become more compelling, more important than ever for us to understand how we got to that moment in world history um, and, and really what might happen here in the United States if we're not attentive, if we don't pay attention and really hold um, all of ourselves accountable for our behavior. So thank you. Thank you for coming. The next speaker is going to be Professor Ken Jassy. Um, he is a professor of art history for us, but he's going to tell you about two things that he does uh, with Holocaust education, the Portraits of Life um, exhibit, and then also to the program. And then he will um, pass it along from there. Ken, thank you so much. Hey, welcome everyone. Um, I'd like to thank, and uh, we've been thanking already, but I'm, I'm very grateful to uh, Tiffany and, and Joanne and Sarah and everyone else uh, who's made this event, uh, this, today's program possible, which um, is something that enriches the cultural life at, at, at Montgomery College. Uh, my particular uh, function today, as, uh, as Sarah mentioned, is as the coordinator of the exhibition and the program Portraits of Life, um, which has been around since, in the years of past, quickly since 2004, and the exhibition of almost uh, 40 Holocaust survivors from this area uh, was most recently on this campus in, in the library a couple of years ago. And next fall, there will be a, a full exhibition of the, of the panels on the Rockville campus in the Sarah Silberman Art Gallery in the, uh, in the art building. Um, the, uh, as I mentioned, Portrait of Life has been around since 2004. Mainly what we've been doing the past few years is uh, working with the Montgomery County Public Schools, uh, having exhibitions with the uh, middle schools and, and high schools as part of a Holocaust education program. Um, and this is to teach about uh, the Holocaust and its uh, many lessons uh, in the interest of uh, learning about the Holocaust, but also fostering tolerance and standing up against, uh, speaking out against discrimination. 
And along with the exhibitions of these documentary panels, uh, I also arranged for Holocaust survivors and you know, speakers to speak to groups um, like, like today. And we have the really you know, precious opportunity to hear directly from uh, a Holocaust survivor uh, for, for how much longer, uh, I don't know, and, and our speaker will uh, address, uh, address that point. So this is a very important occasion. Um, I don't want to spend much more time, so I'd rather bring in our next speaker who will introduce um, uh, Manny Mandel, the, our Holocaust survivor, and that's uh, Lisa Mandeltrup, uh, who's uh, legislative assistant for uh, Sydney Katz of the um, County Council in Montgomery County, and who also happens to be the daughter of our speaker. And she'll talk a little bit about um, those, that circumstance. Thank you. Uh, Professor Jassy gave me the opportunity today and the honor to introduce your speaker. His name is Manny Mandel. I call him Dad. And my dad is a survivor of the Holocaust, specifically of Bergen-Belsen concentration camp. He was very young, but his memories are very vivid and very detailed, as you will hear. His memories of, are of an eight-year-old little boy who arrived at the camp in 1944 for what was supposed to be a brief recuperation stop prior to being taken out of Europe. The brief stop turned into six months, and Bergen-Belsen, you may or may not know, is, was not a killing camp like Auschwitz, but nonetheless, it was a death camp. Many, many, many people died from typhus, from starvation, from malnutrition while they were there. Clearly, my dad was one of the lucky ones, and this makes me one of the lucky ones. It also makes me one of the ones who has a sense of obligation, um, an obligation as an adult child of a Holocaust survivor. When I was in school, um, the Holocaust didn't rise to the level of being taught that it does today, which is a shame. I didn't study it in school. I never talked to my friends about it. I never had a museum to tour. I never had a college professor to talk to me about it. I actually probably didn't realize my dad was a Holocaust survivor until I was probably an adult. I now have adult children, so it's been a while. As the number of Holocaust survivors dwindle, and Ken spoke to that, and I don't like to admit that, but they are dwindling, it's an obligation for my generation and now for my children's generation to teach and enlighten people so that we will never forget. No survivor has a typical story. Every story is different. My father had a very unique experience. Listen to him, learn from him, ask questions, and pass on the information that you learn. If you know other survivors, talk to them. Record what they say, both in your own mind and take out your phone or whatever and record what they say for the benefit of others. Um, my dad participated in a very special ceremony in Germany at Bergen-Belsen to commemorate the 70th anniversary of the liberation of the camp. This was back in 2015. Um, as part of his remarks, he said, and I quote, as many survivors say today, standing on the ashes of the millions who were annihilated, we embody the legacy of the Holocaust. The courage and the dignity of the survivors shed a bright light on our children and our grandchildren who by their very existence defy the Nazis' final solution to the Jewish question. I'm very proud to be one of those children and to introduce you to my dad, Manny Mandel. I don't know if this is on, I suppose this is on. I have nobody to introduce, I mean, I've been introduced now three or four times. <laughs> so my job is to, in fact, deliver the bacon. I had no idea that the title of this talk will be what is listed over here, the Holocaust and the danger of not learning from history. 
The reason I say that is because in all of my talks, and if not in all, in most of my talks, I quote a person who most of you do not know, but whose words you do know. And I'm going to ask that you raise your hand if you have never heard of the man who said, those of us who do not learn our history well may be doomed to repeat it. Well, nobody raised their hand. That means all of you have heard of him. Oh, well. George Santayana said this. Many of us have read some things about Santayana, but that's not important. What's important to me is what he said. And I can underline that by saying that being a volunteer at the Holocaust Museum, I bump into many, many people. I speak at the museum, away from the museum. I've even traveled for the museum. And ladies and gentlemen, the knowledge of what took place in the 1930s and 40s is so abominably low that we can all be ashamed. Now, this is not a blaming of you, but it's just a fact of life. We don't tend to learn about history, and we don't tend to use that which we do not learn from history. It's unfortunate, because if you think about it for a moment, we can in no way learn from the future. But we can learn from the past and apply that to the future. And if we don't do it, we run into all kinds of troubles in many, many parts of the world. And that's the end of my commercial. I'm here to tell you some a bird's eye view of what happened in the memory of a child who has learned about that memory many, many times since. And interestingly, my experience is quite different than what you've heard because by the rights of population, much of what you heard about in issues having to do with Holocaust come out of Poland. Poland was the largest Jewish community in Europe. About 10% of the population, almost 10%, was Jewish, and 3.5 million of them died. As a consequence, most of the survivors that you meet are from Poland or its environs. I'm not. The Holocaust in my life comes very late, and I'll talk about it in a moment. I had much more of an experience and fear from the war than the Holocaust. Okay? A little background. While I was born not in Hungary, Hungary is native to my mother, my father, and to me. I happen to have been born in the city of Riga, which is in Latvia, but that's because there's a rule in life that says you must be born where your mother is. Well, my father had a job in Riga, and the job was about to come to an end, and he was going to move to Budapest, which was the dream of his lifetime. And, but I, they had to wait for me to kind of arrive until I could travel. So that although I was born in Riga, and that says so on the material, I know nothing about Latvia. I knew, do remember that my wife and I went to Riga for a weekend on a trip to Europe, and my father was still alive, and he said, look up pasta yella seche. That was the extent of his Latvian. It meant Post Street 6, which was their address, which we looked up. But that's all I know about Riga, except for the weekend we spent there. It's a nice city. I'd like to go back and see it some more. I was raised in Hungary, where my parents, which was the part of my parents' ethnicity. My mother comes from southern Hungary, which you might know better as Yugoslavia, the former Yugoslavia. Before the First World War came to an end, much of Austro-Hungary was chopped up and Yugoslavia was created. My mother is from the northern part of that country, which is not part of Serbia, or is Serbia in fact, but it was part of southern Hungary. My father comes from eastern Hungary, from Transylvania, where the most famous resident was a man my father did not know, and you all know his name, Count. That's the one. So that there are Hungarians ethnically, and we live in Budapest, and uh, life is good. You need to know, just as a piece of history, that the Hungarians, as a result of the First World War alliance with Germany, began to pass anti-Jewish laws in the 20s, maybe 10 years before the Germans began to do the Nuremberg laws. The Hungarian laws, known as the numerous clauses, were restrictive in that they restricted what Jews could do, where they could work, how many could go to school. It was a quota system. The laws were passed, but they were not enforced. So in the 20s and the early 30s, the Hungarian Jewish community had as free a life as could be conceived. 
and I mean that. I do nothing about it. I was born in 1936, but I know about it from what I've learned in history and what my parents and family have told me. However, the war begins in the late 30s, and Hungary being an, a country that's allied with Germany, making it unique in Europe and only similar to Italy, is bombed by the Allies from one side, from the Russians from the other side, so that our trips to the shelters once, twice, sometimes three times a night were very much an impression-making event in my life. In some ways, an exciting one, because here I am, a six- and seven-year-old kid who is down with all the adults in the middle of the night, hiding from the bombing. What also happened, of course, which didn't happen specifically to me, was that the bombing came and buildings were bombed that I never knew that when I came up in the morning and went to school, the building next door to us might have been bombed and my friend with whom I went to school may have been dead. So that the war is much more of an issue to me, as I remember it at the time, than a Holocaust. Yet it was a Holocaust-related experience that's my first in my memory banks. Let me tell you about that. In the winter of 1941, I'm five and a half years old. My mother and father decided I was not yet in school, that some time went to time, Christmas vacation kind of time, that they would go south by train from Budapest to Yugoslavia to visit my grandparents. My grandparents lived in the city of Novi Sad, which also is called Uyvidek, which is also called Neuzatz, typically two and three names to a city because it depends on which week you're talking about or who was the ruler. And we went to see my grandparents and my mother's two sisters, my aunts, and we had a very nice day or two. I don't recall what we did, although I did rem do remember going to my uncle's factory. He had a cork factory. And he made cork products. And I went there and I have no idea what I saw. About the third day, we're staying in my aunt's house, my, yeah, my mother's younger sister, and uh, somebody comes up the elevator and says, there's something funky going on in the street. Within five minutes, as I recall, two police officers, very well-mannered, came to the door. Knock, knock. Ladies and gentlemen, you must get dressed warmly. It's winter time. It's not bitter, but there's snow on the ground. Because you have to come outside for a census. Now, you need to know that the Nazis did censuses, if that's the plural of census, every 20 minutes. I exaggerate. They believed, rightly so, that if they knew exactly where everybody was at all times, they could control the population. Now, we do a census every 10 years, right? But there were censuses done all the time. It was unusual to have a census outdoors in the middle of the day, in the morning. But it didn't seem like there was anything about it that was anything particularly difficult. We got dressed, put on muffs and scarves and hats and coats, went outside, were told to line up on a seat on the street, sidewalk, turn left, and walk in that direction, which we did for some time. Several hours. I remember that I walked, my mother carried me, my father carried me. I'm five and a half years old, I'm a little guy. And we arrived at a place which I recognized peculiarly. This was the sidewalk, this is the main road is over here, the sidewalk is over here, and to the left of the sidewalk is an eight foot stockade fence. Now, for those of you who've been to Europe, or when they know about this, you know that European communities that are not on lakes or the ocean, but on the river, will make beaches and summertime recreation places from the river. Now, the Danube River, major river in Europe, goes through the city of Novi Sad. And this particular stockade fence was two or 300 yards away from the river, which in the summertime had hay wave pools and hot pools and cold pools and thermal pools and restaurants and recreation places and amusement parks. It's a lovely, lovely place, which I remembered having been there probably the previous August, two or three months before. But this is winter, folks. The Danube River has three feet of frozen solid ice. If you're bewildered, so were we. And I don't mean just me. I mean, I was bewildered because I didn't know how not to be bewildered as a kid. But the adults were. They had no idea why we were there. As we were marching down, slowly ambling, by this time my grandparents came out, some others came out, and we had a group of about 15 people kind of huddled together, marching slowly towards the open gates. The stockade fence had open gates 
which is where you'd enter in the summertime, and I guess where the supplies went in as well. And people went down and they made a left turn into the gates, but that was a couple hundred yards away from us yet. As we're standing here and ambling slowly, there's a police officer standing over there who says to my father, Mister, what are you doing here? In perfect Hungarian, of course. That's the language of the neighborhood. My father told him, I'm here visiting my family. He says, well, that's, that's your business, that's not mine. The reason I'm asking what you're doing here is because you're not from here. I know you're not from here because I happen to be a foot policeman brought in from Budapest for this particular event, for this census, and I've seen you on the street many, many, many times, walking to the grocery store, the pharmacy, or your office, or whatever. I recognize you. Now, if we can't count you and the people around you into the census, it'll mess up the numbers. Can't have that. He says to my father, take your people and stand aside. So we did. Bewildered? Yes. Within minutes, it seems, of this particular stand aside, a staff car comes down the main road, a uniformed officer gets out, has a power with his buddies, gets on a bullhorn and says, ladies and gentlemen, the requirements of the census have been met. Please go home. If you'd like to have some hot coffee or hot chocolate, there's a school right down here. You're welcome to do We did not bother with the coffee and the hot chocolate. My father hailed the first cab he could find and went back to my aunt's house. So you say to yourself, what in heaven's name took place? Let me tell you what took place. A couple days before this event, there had been some particular noise of some sort by some partisan group, and I'm not going to detail what partisans are, I hope you know what they were, exploding a truck or a train, and in retaliation for that activity, the local government decided to have a pogrom to teach the community a lesson. What did they do? Everybody who went down to that open gate and turned left, marched 300 yards or so to the river, which had been blasted open by cannon fire that morning. 350 folks were shot in the back into the river, never to be found again or found when the river thawed in March or floated down underneath the ice to Belgrade or someplace else. A pogrom, by definition, is a senseless, purposeless, useless, valueless activity that says, I can do this to you, and there's nothing you can do about it. That was the first Holocaust experience of this five and a half year old child. Again, at the time I knew nothing, but I learned. We go back to my aunt's house, and uh, the phone is buzzing off the hook. The phones were still working in those days. And one of the early calls that comes in is from my other aunt, my mother's other sister, who says, where were you all day? I mean, we had some plans that day. I don't know what, but some plans. And my mother, I guess, told my aunt that uh, what we did, and she says, that's interesting. 7.30 in the morning, two policemen came to my door. I did what I would normally do, and if you knew my aunt, you'd know exactly how. I invited them in for coffee and cake. These two police officers had the best coffee and cake, coffee and cake of the life, because when my aunt served coffee and cake, she had 18 coffees, 19 cakes, and a whole room full of dishes. They asked her three questions and left. That was her experience. Ours was different. As the calls kept coming in, that's how the information started coming in to say to my father and the rest of the adults what actually took place. The only people that we knew that were hurt in this particular pogrom did not take place at the Danube. The aunt we were staying with, her in-laws, lived in a house on the outskirts of town. The soldiers came, asked them some questions, did not like the answers, they were shot on the spot. So my aunt's in-laws were killed at the pogrom in their home that day. The next morning, my father and my mother decided the thing to do, of course, is to go home, which is an interesting idea. Think about this, folks. Here we are in a community with my aunt, with my two aunts, and a cousin, and my grandparents, a city where my, my, where my mother grew up, where my mother and father met. They knew the community, but that was not home. 
My father and mother said, home is where you go, back to Budapest, where we had no family whatsoever. But that was home. And interestingly to me, as a kid, I remember one of the experiences of going home, which was very exciting. My father ordered a taxi to go to the train station. Well, what showed up was a one-horsepower taxi. Any idea what that is? Not a buggy, a sleigh. It was snow outside. It was not heavy snow. They ran regular tra uh, taxis, you know, motors and stuff. But they also had taxis with actually with radios on them that could come pick you up and take you to the train station. So for a five and a half year old kid to ride in a sleigh in the middle of the winter is great fun. And that he remembers. Went to the train station, maybe three hours by train back to Budapest. Nothing particularly remarkable. And we're back in Budapest. And now, of course, this, is, this took place in December 41. We went to 1942 very quickly. 42, I'm six years old, I begin to go to school. And I begin to have recollections of what were the elements of the Holocaust as I began to know them. The bombing continues. That's the war. Going to school was an experience which was much more complicated than I knew. <coughs> the yellow star was inst installed. You've seen these yellow stars, and everybody had to wear one, including kids five and a half, six years old. First grade, yellow star, go to school. Now, we lived on one of the main streets of Budapest. Anybody been to Budapest? Well, if you know it, and if you know it, it's the main street that runs along the same street where the big synagogue is, the Tabak Temple. The Veselinu Street, we lived at number 13. My school was at number 44, like three blocks away. I mean, from my parents' bedroom, they had, we had one on the fifth floor of the building, and the bedroom was on a corner. So if you looked out the corner, you could see the school, three blocks down the road. Yet somebody would follow me to school almost every day. Why? Because incidents took place, not to me, whereby a kid walking to school was whacked on the head because he had a target on his jacket called the Yellow Star. They didn't want his boots, they didn't want his books, they didn't want his jacket. They just wanted to whack him on the head. It was open season. I thought the Yellow Star was a terrific kind of a mark of distinction. Here I am, six years old, and I got a Yellow Star, just like the adults. It will be from my side, right? A little later, I learned that this is not a, a mark of distinction. It's a target. The Hungarian male community was in the army. As a matter of fact, the Hungarian soldiers were in the Russian front. To back up the work that could not be done by them was given to the Hungarian Jewish community, which was not drafted. My father was not drafted into the army. Jews were not in the military in the Second World War, Hungarian Jews. They were drafted into organizations called labor battalions. It's forced labor, but it's not slave labor. I mean, they were collected and set up in platoons and companies and whatnot. My father would get a phone call or a letter or somebody would come to the door and say, on Tuesday at 3 o'clock, you'll be at this train station. You'll be gone for a day, a week, a month, or an indeterminate period of time to do various kinds of repair work. There's some mining, some agricultural work, some fixing of potholes, some road repair, not only he, but all the others. This was manpower, labor power. The strange and peculiar part was it that the people who were in these labor battalions from the city of Budapest had been people primarily from the professions. These folks never had a hammer in their hand or a shovel in their hand. But you know something? You learn. I don't know what my father did specifically, but he was there. From 1942 to 1944, he would be gone and home and home and gone to the point that I really hardly saw him. And when he was home, it was not any more important to me than he was not home. He was not a constant in my life. His youngest brother, who was still at the university, my uncle David, lived with us for a while. David became much more of a father figure to me at the time to the point that when my son was born, uh, guess what his name is? His name is David. Lisa has a younger brother called David. Now, my father is away, the yellow star happens, and other events begin to happen, which in my memory is like pulling the strings on a 
on a duffel bag, tightening the strings. Example, man comes to the door, says, I must take your telephone. Why? A law was passed, or in fact, a law was passed a long time ago, and now it's being put into effect, these were numerous clauses of the 20s, that Jews may not have telephones. My father did need his telephone for work, but what could you do? Man took the phone. Most middle class citizens of the community, and we certainly were, had household help. It's not unusual. But remember, to replace the washing machine, the drying machine, the toaster, the microwave, the freezer, and the ice making machine, plus whatever else there was, you'd need to have hands. And the hands came with this young woman, maybe 17 years old, from one of the local farms, who lived in our house, had her own room and bath. And she was the, not the governor, she was just my buddy. Because in terms of age, I was by this time almost eight, and she was the closest thing to me in age. And we had, she was not particularly an intellect. I mean, she had the intellectual level of an eight-year-old. So we were, we were got on famously. She had to go. She wanted to take me with her back to her farm. My parents chose not to do that. They didn't know what the future would bring. But she had to leave, and uh, my mother had to do all the work that had to be done, and she did it. I mean, what are you going to do? She also, you want to remember, my mother at the time is uh, in her 30s. She's a healthy, strong woman. And she learned how to do all these things by herself, as opposed to being the helper to the young woman who was the worker. One of the days my father's home from camp, from his labor camp, I said to him, Pop, I'd like you to think about doing something for me. What would you like? He said, I said to him, look, I have this rather overgrown tricycle. Would you consider getting me a bike? Economics were not an issue at the time, I mean, the money we had. He said, I'd be glad to get you a bike. Not a full size, but like an 18-incher, but I won't. What did I do? He says, well, there are two problems, a small one which I can deal with and a big one which I will not. We live on the fifth floor of this apartment building, the top floor, and we have an elevator. The elevator is as old as the building, which is 50 years. It's often out of commission. And the mechanical parts that need to be manufactured for this elevator are manufactured now by a factory that is now working on armaments and, and, and putting various kinds of steel on cars and stuff. And the elevator parts are very low on the priority pole, on the priority list for, for repair. So what I have to do is I take the bicycle, schlep it downstairs, go out to the park, you have to ride somewhere, go out, ride in the park, come back and schlep the bike up. He said, I would do that. As much of a pain as that is, I would do that. I could not take a 18 inch bicycle up five flights. I just physically couldn't do it. He says, I will do it, but I won't. Why? Because if we're in the park, and you ride the bike, and for 12 seconds you're out of my sight, with a yellow star, somebody may very well hit you on the head, hitting the target, and that I don't want to happen. They don't want the bike, they don't want your shoes, they don't want anything else, just like when going to school, but this is a target. And for that reason, I'm not going to take the risk of having you be targeted in that sense. Now, I wasn't targeted, but others were, and we know of situations where this did take place. This was just that overcaution on my father's part. What it began to tell me at the age of seven and a half or so was that this, in fact, was not a mark of distinction. In fact, there was a target. As things go on, my father isn't home, the maid isn't there, the yellow star is there, the air raids continue, there's no telephone, and in fact, the numerous clauses laws of the 20s are activated by the Hungarian, the Hungarian Nazi party whose symbol were crossed arrows. They were called Hungarian nyilas. Anybody know the word? Nyilas, crossed arrows. This continues, and now we are I mean, out of first grade almost. And as you may remember, there is a conference in Berlin called the Wannsee Conference. It takes place in 1942. In 41, The Nazi government, specifically the number two man in the Nazi government, who's that? Hitler, who's next? 
Goering, exactly. Hermann Goering writes a letter at Proclamation which talks about the purpose of the final solution to the Jewish problem. You know what the final solution was to be. That letter was not into put into actual effect in 41, but in 42 at the Wannsee Conference, the leader of the Nazi party in Eastern Europe, in Prague specifically, calls a conference where a man is appointed for the purpose of carrying out the wishes of Goering's letter. Man's name is Adolf, Adolf, thank you, sir. Uh, will you come up here and take over? <laughs> Adolf Eichmann, who is a lieutenant colonel in the, in the German army and does a very effective job in running the trains. From 42 on, he clears all of Europe. And get what, what's the last country that he clears? Hungary. Why? First, it had the second largest Jewish population, but secondly, it was an ally of Germany. Until almost the time that Eichmann arrives in Hungary, the Hungarians were allies. And then Hitler and Horthy, the leader of Hungary, had a problem, and Hungary pulled out, and so forth and so on. The politics of it are not important to me at the moment. But Eichmann arrives to Budapest on the 19th of March, 1944. Now, ladies and gentlemen, D-Day is June 7th. The war ends May 8th, 1945. So this is very, very late in the causes of the war. And everybody in the Nazi government knows what the end is going to be, <clears throat> with the exception of one man, who is the one who would not believe what the end would be. You said his name a minute ago. Hitler never believed the war would end as it did. Never. But everybody else knew. And by this time, in, late, in middle 44, they were beginning to make arrangements, believe it or not, for their life after the war, including all the way up to number three, who was Himmler. Uh, to digress for a half a second, Hitler survived, Himmler survives the war. He tries to escape, he is recaptured, at which point he takes cyanide. But Himmler was making arrangements for his life after the war. Eichmann was making arrangements, and so were many, many others. You recall what happened to Eichmann after the war? Sorry? Yeah, but what happens in the war and the pickup time? Years go by. He lives a very comfortable life in Arge I, I can't quite hear you guys, Argentina, right? As does Dr. Joseph Mengele, the famous Auschwitz doctor, and others. But the point is, he arrives in Budapest on March 19th, 1944, sets up his offices and his headquarters in the Excelsior Hotel, and he was the biggest dog in town. To go see, I to go see Eichmann in those days probably was as easy as seeing the Pope, or the President, or Hitler. Yet two men from kind of a self-appointed rescue committee approach him and they propose a deal. Now get a load of this. The deal is that if he takes a million Jews out of concentration camps and releases them, they will provide him with 10,000 trucks laden with materiel against the Eastern Front. Now, if you folks want to start laughing, go ahead. It's ridiculous. Eichmann didn't have a million Jews to release, even if he wanted to. Not at that point. And these guys didn't have a hubcap. Nothing. I mean, I don't mean they had a few trucks. One of the two was sent to Cairo to negotiate with the British, who were in charge of the vehicular and other kind of material stuff for all of the European theater. He's arrested in Cairo, put into jail as a spy, survives the war in Cairo in jail. After the war, he's released and lives for a good number of years afterwards and dies, I guess, a happy man, whatever. The other man continues to negotiate. The two men's name were Joel Brand, who was sent to Cairo, and Rudolf Kastner, 
of whom you may not know, unfortunately, who in fact keeps on negotiating with Eichmann. The negotiations of a million Jews for 10,000 trucks, which they called blut blood, for var, for materiel, is reduced or exchanged or transformed into heavy, heavy valuables. Now, people say to me, that's money. Money was useless. The British pound sterling was useful, but nobody had it. And the American dollars were useful, and nobody had that. But diamonds and, and rubies and other kinds of, of negotiable material we had around the world. And for that, he was willing to take some 1,700 people and take them out of Europe. You remember, Hitler's position was out of Germany, out of Europe, out of the world. He accomplished two of those, pretty much. The selection of 1,700 people was made from the Hungarian Jewish community in a million different ways, which would take me two weeks to explain, if I could explain. But my mother and I and my Uncle David were three of the, of the spots that were given to be on this train. We were put on 35 boxcars. How many of you have been to the museum, how downtown? You've been there, you've seen the boxcars? One of those. That's an actual boxcar down there. And we had a boxcar like that, I don't know, maybe 60 people in the car, to be taken to a free port, a neutral port maybe in Spain, to be dispatched out of Europe. The train went north. That's about all we knew, and I didn't know anything. But people could tell somebody had a compass, went north. And after nine days on the train, which is survivable, we wound up, as my daughter said, in Bergen-Belsen. This was to have been a three-day R&R stop before we were to board ships. It became five months, five and a half months. Actually, after half of about six weeks, 350 people were taken by German troop train this time out of American Belgium into Switzerland as part of the deal. Guess what? I wasn't one of them. I was part of the second group, which in December of 1944, in fact, left Bergen Belsen by passenger train, by troop train, and we wound up in Switzerland. And for me, as a kid of at that time, what, six, eight, eight and a half, almost nine, uh, my war, my Holocaust, and all of that experience was over. I had no idea where my father was. I was with my mother throughout. And at that point, my war ends. Now, there are many other parts of this that I did not detail because we only had the time that it's allotted, and the rest of it takes much more time. I'm willing to stop and be open for questions as long as you folks have time to do the questions. Thank you. I've been asked by the uh, MCTV folks that you go to the mics. There's one back there. They'll bring them to you. There's a stationary mic here as well, I think. Is that all? Mm -hmm. Yep. So we have, we have one microphone over here. I have one to pass around. So. And if you're close by, I can hear you. Anybody have a question? Comment? Statement? Not all at once. Hello? I'm still on mic. I'm on the mic, right? You hear me. OK, good. Yes? Yes, uh, I just want to say a comment. Um, I am currently writing a novel on, uh, it's, a, it's a fictionalized uh, historical novel on World War II, but staying very accurate. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate the fact that you're here and that we have the honor to see you and to hear you and that you have taken this time to be with us. And I just want to say thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. What's, what's the name of the novel? What's the name of the book? I'm calling it Deception, Schlafenicht, which is Sleep Not. And it's to bring out the Holocaust, um, the atrocities, and to bring it to such a, a better understanding. You and said Deception? It's called Deception. Is yeah, it the story about? It's about World War II, takes place in France, no. and um, other parts, but it, it is about Taking, uh, the, the the deception Jewish. was a film that was made about 10 years ago, starring 007. 
It's not a 007 story. It's a story of the Wojcicki family, partisans in Poland. And the strange part of that is that another film was made called Denial, starring his now wife, Rachel Weiss. You see it? Okay. So, Deception and Denial by two parts of the 007 team. Anything else? Hi, thank you for speaking to us. This is actually my second time to hear you speak, and thank you, it means a lot. I wanted to ask you, what was your father's profession? My father was a cantor all his life. A cantor? A cantor. And his dream in life was to be one of the chief cantors of the main synagogue of Budapest, which he achieved, except for the guy with a little mustache kind of messed it up for him. What a cantor is? Well, all religions have cantors. In the Jewish community, he's the, he is the services leader. He's the one who sings. Uh, there was a very famous cantor in Bonn, Germany, some hundreds of years ago. He had a three-word three name called Johann Sebastian Bach. He was a cantor. The music leader of the church or synagogue or religious service is called a cantor. My father was with one of the major synagogues in Budapest, and he had a choir led by a choir leader of 40 male voices. That was his dream in life, and he achieved it. Thank you. Hi. Sorry, that was loud. Hi. Um, was it like you said that you were taken out of your concentration camp by troops? Were they American troops? No, this is 1944. The war had not ended yet. The Germans, as part of the deal, in fact, took us out and put us on trains and took us to Switzerland, saved our lives. Okay, so it was the Germans that took you out and took you to Switzerland. What it's was part the, of the deal. What was that process like, like the removal, I guess? What was that process like? Well, we were told, uh, the leadership of the camp was told that on a given day, we would march out to the train station, which is about five, six kilometers from our particular part of the camp. We are put into train cars and we would be taken to Switzerland. I mean, by that point, it was simple. We knew what would, what would happen at that time. Two weeks before, we didn't know when we would go where, when we would be killed or bombed or whatever. But the negotiations continued, and the negotiations finally achieved the original purpose of the, of the whole plan of exchanging valuables with which Nazis lived after the war for people. They couldn't kill us. I mean, they could, but they didn't because if they killed us, you killed a hostage, you don't get the money. And it was important for them to get the loot. So that's Thank you very got. much. Sure. Camp? Can you tell us about your life in the concentration camp sure. for you and your family? Sure, but let me take the next uh, question that, because that it may be question. related. That was my question also. As a child, how you survived there for six months or so. Okay. Uh, we know that people can survive without air for minutes, without water for hours, without food for days. We had, we lived in, has anybody ever, have, how many of you have seen pictures or in life the, what the camps looked like, the enormous barracks that were there? But well, we were living in one of those barracks. Food was delivered twice a day. As it happened, our particular set of barracks were across the main road from one of the field kitchens of the camp. The camp in its heyday had about 25,000 people. So there were several kitchens. And men from our camp were permitted to go under guard across the street and bring back the food. The morning food consisted of these garbage can-like large vats, I don't know, 30 gallon vats or something, that they would bring in, and they would bring in some bread. The bread was pretty good, it was farm bread. But the beauty of what was in the vats is that it was something they called coffee, but it was warm. 
We had all the water we wanted all day long because one of the barracks was a washing barrack. We could go in there, wash up, drink whatever we want. It was not the toilet, that was a latrine. But water we had. But to have something warm was unusual. So we would take this warm stuff in the morning, whatever it was, it was like a dark brown, kind of a tasteless thing. And we had thermoses with us because we were told to bring food with us and drink for the ride to the camp. We put the, therm the, the hot stuff in the thermos, bury it in our bedding, and keep it warm all day long so it could have a warm drink even in the afternoon. That was the morning food. The afternoon food was, again, some kind of a liquid in these vats, which was like a stew or a soup. It was not black, it was brown. And stuff floated in it. It could be a potato or a carrot or even a piece of horse meat. But it was food. The people in the camp became ingenious in what they were able to do with this kind of food and how they were able to manage it. And we had brought some food with us, as we were told to do. A little salt, a little pepper, a little something. All of a sudden, you could eat. All of us lost some weight, but none of us looked like skeletons. Let me add something. We were told that we were going to go on this trip to supposedly an ocean voyage out of Europe. My mother and everybody else took certain things with them. There was a neighborhood factory of sorts in where we lived where the man could repress and reseal tin cans. You know, you had bought something in a tin can, you ate what was in it, you could refill it hot, and they could reseal it and, in a sense, do to it what cans do. They preserve the food. That was, of course, used up fairly quickly. My mother also took with her three items. One was a liter of honey. One was a liter of chicken fat. And one was a big slab of bacon fat. Now, for a kosher home to have bacon in it was highly unusual. But under the circumstances, anything could go. The honey, the, the, the chicken fat, and the bacon lasted six months. Because when you slice it with a razor blade, but when you take a piece of this and a piece of that and a piece of that, all of a sudden, food becomes edible. We took bread, and the slices they gave us, we sliced also with razor blades. So we'd have this much bread and this much something on top, like a salad of sorts, salad in quotes, whatever it was. It was something that was edible. None of us starved. Lost weight, yes. We were hungry, yes. But starved, no. That was the feeding situation. The rest of the day was spent substantially, particularly at the beginning, in, again, in a census. Every day you had to go out. We're told to go out at the crack of dawn, and they would come inspect us. Now, why inspect people every single day when there was no escape and there were guns and whatnot? But that was the rule. We would stay out there until 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 o'clock. Then they would come inspect us and we'd go inside the cabins until one officer, lieutenant, whatever, came by and says, hey, folks, this is ridiculous. I'm going to come at 8 o'clock, let's say. I don't care if you're here one minute before 8. Be here at 8. But you have to be here at 4. It saved lives because people were getting sick, as was I, from standing outside in the muck and the mire of August in Germany, in the, in the, in the, waiting for the, for the Zoll appeal, for the census to take place. So our work was, our life was the census, the food preparation, which took hours because you had to mess with it all over the place. And the third thing that took place in camp was businesses opened up. That's what I said, businesses opened up. The tin cans that we had were the cut up by somebody at tools, and you made earrings, bracelets, necklaces, jewelry. And you didn't sell it, of course. What you did is you traded a earrings for a haircut. And the haircut was traded for the repair of your shoes. And the repair of your shoes was, was traded for two cigarettes. Two cigarettes for something else. <coughs> the, the attempt to not mimic but to, in fact, experience reality and normalcy is so strong that you go into business in the concentration camp selling tin can jewelry. That's what we did in camp. 
Ren, Ren, should we run a mic up here? Whatever. Hello. Um, this is a related question to what, uh, you know, uh, given your description that you just gave. But is, are there any sensory details such as uh, smells or sounds that you associate with those five and a half months? Only negative ones. Any, any even. Well, this is, uh, well, look, it took place so we can talk about it. I told you before that we had a wash basin kind of a barrack, happened to be right next to the one that I was, the barracks were divided into men, women, and families. Families meant mothers with children, like little kids like me. Right next to our particular cabin was this cleanup place where my mother cleaned up every morning and insisted I do the same thing. Around the corner was the latrine. An open trench with a hole and you sat on it, that was the latrine. The smells of the latrine, I don't remember, but I know they were there. Folks spent hours and hours and hours in the latrine. Not eliminating, but debugging. People would make like monkeys trying to get the various vermin out of their bodies, out of their hair places, so forth. The smell of that I remember, not the smell itself, but the fact that it took place. Ma'am? Thank you. What were the attitudes of your non-Jewish neighbors in Budapest as the pogroms were happening? Budapest was, at one point, more than 20% Jewish. I don't recall having many people that I had contact with that were not Jewish, so I didn't talk to them. Although next door to me, right next door in the apartment, was a family, a mother and a grandmother, I don't know what the father was, and two girls who were good buddies of mine, very Catholic kids. Uh, one was a year younger than I, and one was two years older than I. And we played all the time. I have no recollection of non-Jewish or anti-Semitic kind of issues that were directed at me among people that I knew. Now, had I been hit in the head walking to school, that would have been a different issue. But I did not experience that. And many people did not. Some people did. I went to a Jewish school, so I was not subject to anything else in school either. Anything else? Ma'am. Um, children generally tend to find joy in any situation. Did children get to find games? Did they have a sense of joy a little bit? Some way to cope while being in the camp? I think that all the children and the adults, or adults and even the children, were so occupied with the day-to-day, minute-to-minute, joy, joy was limited. Now, the adults tried to make things, quote, nice for us, unquote. They opened up a school. They had holiday parties. And they were joyous. But I don't think, I would not recall joy as being one of the experiences that I had at camp. Thank you. Sarah, are you calling the two people back there? Sir, go ahead. Um, that part of your life growing up and being then freed by your captors and being sent as part of war exchange to another country of Europe, did you want to, when the war ended officially, did you want to stay in that area or come back to here? I know your biography talks about you get college behind you when you went to be involved. Did you ever want to go back and involve yourself in that community that was part of the war you were so brought up in? Not at the age of eight. I mean, we went no. to Switzerland. I don't think there was any thought on the part of my mother to stay in Switzerland because we were in Switzerland, my father was not. We wanted to reunite, and we did. We reunited in what, what was Palestine, and oh. then it became Israel. Right. So, and I made adjustment to life there, yes. language, school, and everything else. And then for various reasons, which I will not detail for the moment, mm -hmm. my parents decided they had the option to come to the States and they decided to do that. And we had a vote in the family about staying in Israel or leaving. The vote was two to one to leave. I lost. Right. 
So there I would have wanted to stay. Right? I would have wanted to stay. I was too young to be there by myself. I was only 13. Yeah, 13. Right. Perhaps if I had been five years older, because okay. if I had been five years old, I wouldn't have survived <laughs> the war. But if I had been five years old, I might have stayed and they would have gone. But the family vote was two to one. I lost. Yeah. So that was an adjustment that we could not make that way. Yeah. All right. There was a Thank lady you. with a question. Yes. Hi. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about um, films and books that portray the Holocaust. And I wondered if, um, as a survivor, you have any recommendations for books or films that you feel have a particularly useful um, perspective on sure. the Holocaust? I'll give you two. No, 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 I'll put that away. There's a book written by a Canadian historian called the Kastner, K-A-S-Z-T-N-E-R, Train. It's a very good book. He, I mean, she details the story perhaps better than I do. The only difference is she didn't live through it. Her name is Anna Porter. There's another book about the same story, but written from a different perspective, by a man who was with me at camp, three years old and nine. And just to tell you how strange things are, this is a Hungarian-born, Swiss-educated, German professor retired in England. Ladislaus, spell it phonetically, Ladislaus Loeb, L-O-B. You could perhaps remember the name of the book as Dealing with Satan. This was the deal that Kastner was negotiating with Eichmann. And Lotzi Loeb, whom I know, wrote a book about it from the perspective of having been a participant in this thing. I mean, as a kid, what he remembered. It's different than the Canadian author who writes from historic research. These are two books I would recommend that you look at, that tell you the story of, that's specific that there was me. I didn't mean me, but for my particular thing, not the Holocaust itself. Okay? You mentioned. Well, somebody wrote a book. This just came out, folks. And I'm not selling books today. Maybe I should have brought some. But Imi is a diminutive of the name Emmanuel, spelled phonetically in Europe. I-M-M-I, -M -M -I, Emmanuel. The picture of Imi in the middle, eight year, six years old, with his mother and his father. That's the story I just told you today. It's available through Amazon. And Barson Noble and anybody else. <laughs>